and a Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters and guests. Climate activists tell us that the Earth has experienced unusual warming since the end of the Industrial Revolution. In my presentation today, I'm going to drill down into the data to try to determine, is that warming real? And if it is, do we have any idea how much warming is actually occurring? This is the graph that you see. You might call it the touchstone of the global warming movement. What it shows is temperatures above and below the average from 1961 to 1990. Okay, so that zero line is the average for 1961 to 1990. When it's red, that means it's hotter than that average. When it's blue, that means that it's cold, okay? Now I have a confession to make. I don't care at all about global average temperature, which this supposedly is. And I don't think you or anyone else should care either, because no one experiences global average temperature. We simply experience temperatures in regions where we live, where animals and plants are, okay? There isn't a super being sort of straddling the planet saying, I feel too hot this year. You know, so this kind of a, a graph is actually rather meaningless. And as an example, I'll, I'll just explain an example. Let's pretend half the Earth got 10 degrees warmer and half the Earth got 10 degrees colder. Now that would probably be a meteorological catastrophe. You know, with that kind of a temperature difference, you'd have tornadoes and hurricanes and all sorts of things. And yet the average would be the same, okay? But regardless whether it should or shouldn't, this is the touchstone. This is what people look to when they talk about global warming. So, as I said, today I'm going to drill down into the data and see, does this actually make sense? Do we actually have any confidence at all? Now, to do that, we have to notice something. We're talking about warming. So that means you have to know what's going on in the beginning of the record so that you can compare today's conditions against something. So what was happening in 1885, for example? How did they determine the global average temperature? This is where they had their temperature measuring stations. Every one of these dots, red or blue, was a temperature measuring station, a weather station that gave temperature for the determination of global average temperature. You can see there's almost nothing in South America, almost nothing in the oceans, very little in Africa, and nothing in Greenland. But let's go through the years and watch how the database of weather stations, and that's what this is, these are weather stations that gave us temperature to calculate an average global temperature. Let's go through the years and see how it changes. This is the date up here, 1885, 1905, 1925, 1945, 1965, getting pretty dense now in parts of the world. 1985, pretty good in the United States, uh, pretty good in Japan, England, parts of Europe, Australia. But then look what happened, 2005. I'll go back, there's 1985. We fall off a cliff. Okay, suddenly there are very few temperature sensing stations that they're using to calculate the average. And the latest data I have, which is 2006, is even worse. This is how they calculate the average. These are the only places, these are the temperature sensing weather stations that are used to determine that graph. So we have to ask ourselves, what's going on here? Okay, this is, this is actually showing you the number of temperature measurements that are being used against the number, against the year. And what you see are two major falls, one here and one here, okay? Now this fall occurred, in fact, both falls occurred because they actually reduced the number of temperature sensing stations that were supplying data to calculate average temperature. Now, just for interest's sake, let's put the global average temperature graph that came out of these measurements, let's superimpose it and see, see something interesting, okay? Look at this. When the first drop and the number of stations used to calculate average global temperature occurred, we saw global warming. Isn't that interesting? Oh, and look at this. When we had a big drop in the number of stations used, we saw lots of global warming. Okay, now, what's going on? Climatologist Dr. Tim Ball and I were on the phone the other day, and he said what happened was initially, they thought that the satellites and the automated ground weather stations could take over from the weather stations, okay? So this reduction was somewhat sensible. But this reduction occurred because they found that when they started to use the satellite measurements, it wasn't showing the degree of warming that the theory said should happen. So some scientists are kind of activists, you know, they're not just pure scientists. And what they did is they closed many of the rural stations starting around 1990. Now the rural stations are the cold ones. Okay, way out in the country. You can see the attraction. I mean, if you're a scientist and you have to either go out over to that field or trudge way up into the Gatineau, 
that would come from three feet of deep snow, you know, to get to your temperature measuring station. You can see the attraction to closing the, r the rural stations. And that's in fact what happened. Most of the stations that were closed were rural coal stations. So Dr. Ball says that this supposed warming is not real. It's just a reflection of the fact that we closed many, many of the cold weather stations. Okay, so NASA, NASA's interesting. NASA says, well, don't worry. We have 81% of the northern hemisphere covered. And you can see that right here. Okay, this shows the coverage of the northern hemisphere by temperature sensing stations. Okay, so we need the fine print under this graph. Here's what it says. Percent hemispheric area within 1,200 kilometers of a reporting station. 1,200 kilometers? Well, that, look, let, let's see what that would look like. If you have a temperature sensing station in Toronto, that means you don't need any more sensing stations within a 1,200 radius circle, okay? So that goes from subarctic at the bottom end of James Bay to the Carolinas, which is subtropical. According to NASA, that would be covered. Now, they actually do have many more temperature sensing stations in that region, but for parts of the world where there are very few temperature sensing stations, they say all they need is to have a sensing station within 1,200 kilometers, and that part of the world is covered. Well, <laughs> let's take a look at our graph again and ask, how much of this do we really feel confident about? Well, certainly not the beginning part of the graph. You saw how sparse the data was. Most of the world wasn't covered at all. And we have to also remember that the measurements were made with mercury thermometers. They have an accuracy of only plus or minus a half a degree. Dr. Ball says the accuracy really on, in the field is more like plus or minus a degree, okay? So the uncertainty could be that big. All these little changes probably don't mean anything at all. And the recent record, because they closed so many of the cold stations, we don't really know what's going on here either. It is true we have much more accurate electronic measurement devices for temperature, thermocouples, started around 1960, but we have so few stations that are left open. So the only part of the record where we have reasonable coverage, and we're also using electronic measurements, is this part here, which shows no warming. <laughs> the best part of the record shows no warming. So, is global warming really happening? Well, I'd say probably, because we have other indicators, but we're far from certain. How much temperature has risen? We have no idea, okay? So when you hear temperature rise of this degree or that degree, the truth is, in comparison with the early part of the record, we have no idea. And yet, because of graphs like that, we're spending a billion dollars a day trying to stop something that might not even be real. <laughs>